It's this new age form of bullying where, and that's what I believe a lot of this is, like everything, all from, from politics to the trial to if you don't give us what we want, then we're going to burn your city down. That's bullying. These are the same people that stood up for anti-bullying. Right. And they're now doing it in their own way and thinking that now it's okay because they're bullying the what they call the bullies. And your mom ever teach you that two wrongs don't make a right? <laughs> like, these are all basic shit that I learned when I was like fucking five years old. Like, where did all that go is my biggest question. Oh, by the way, welcome back to Talk Hard. <laughs> the Talk Hard podcast where we like to talk about some pretty interesting shit and we'll get into all of it all the way across the board. Episode two, by the way. Episode two. Is it? I think it is. Are we going to hold on to one? We might hold on to one. We so might this, hold on to one. This so might, this might uh, still be cut one. this out. Episode one. <laughs> 1. 1.5. 1. 1.5. Uh, yeah. <sighs> so just in case this is one, my name is Brian Gordon, and this is Marty Norman. What's up, everybody? I'm Marty Norman. And we got together, what was it? This podcast has taken quite a few years. <laughs> It truly has. It truly has. It's been in the making for a couple years at least. Like I I ran into you on Facebook through somebody that recommended that I follow you because of recovery. And then you moved to Brownsburg and ran into you at the gym, which turned into just general conversation, which we had like a a general connection because we understand each other, Mm -hmm. which then turned into like randomly one day. I was like, you know what? I want to start a podcast. And you're like, me too. Been thinking about it for a long time, right? Well, ever since <clears throat> ever since Monday motivation, you know, I moved uh, again. Connections and like attracts like, and the universe bringing people together. You know, me moving to Brownsburg, which is where you're at. You know, me coming up here two years ago, um, and and opening and being a part and co founding of a treatment center. So basically, all my focus. What I was doing previous to moving to Brownsburg was, you know, I was, you know, I was working in treatment. I had recovery homes. I had the Truman houses. Whoop, whoop. Anyway, so I had. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I had all that, you know, and then I moved to Brownsburg. And then I, you know, of course, I had Monday Motivation, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, was a huge success in the amount of people that it connected to and the amount of people that it helped and the amount of responses that I got, engagements, and all these different things that happened from that show with me and Brian Kendrick, right? So with me and Brian, just, you know, first off, that show started off in my in my Toyota Corolla, right? you know, me and him and a cell phone just being silly and, and living our lives in recovery and, try, you know, we hashtag the word uh, goobers in recovery, and that turned into what, uh, I'm con- I'm convinced as probably one of the best recovery shows out there that I've seen, you know. So uh so I I value it as a huge success and I value you know success is a uh you know it's it's, it's a perspective. So my perspective is that it was hugely successful because of the amount of people and the amount of responses that I got and and and, and how far it went. I mean the, the the show went across the world. I got I got um I got followers from Nigeria, from Canada, Australia, you know, you can almost name any country and I've had responses from that. So I I view it as a successful thing. But when I got up here, I was so hyper focused on on opening the streaming center and getting things going and making sure, man, because, you know, me, you know, I'm 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 an addict. I'm I'm in recovery and I'm always waiting for the bottom to fall out of anything good in my life. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I, I think it's part of the, the nature of the disease, actually. But So I, I, gotta, I had to push everything aside and Monday motivation to the side. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when I tried to redo it with Brian uh, once or twice, and it just didn't have that spark no more. And that's when I realized, you know, like, you know, that, that, por- that, that chapter of my life was, it's on, you know, had to move on to a new chapter, you know. Which, like a book... You know, every chapter's got its characters. We're going to bring Brian back. Brian. Absolutely, Brian. You're, you're definitely joining us. I actually spoke to him today. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You see how he does so, that, Chris? Yeah. Just, yeah. I'm slick like that. <laughs> um, but yeah. You know, so, yeah. chapters. Here we are in the podcast. While it's fun to talk about dumb shit and the reality of what people are doing in the world today, the point of this podcast, yeah. I believe, 
is the reason why we're talking about this shit is because I believe that we need to live in a world where we're allowed to. Because we live in like, just like the Rittenhouse trial, a very desensitized world where you're not allowed to talk about things like words you're not allowed to say anymore and things you're not allowed to do anymore. But at the same time, then you're adding a bunch of new words to things like how you identify people. And, and, and I'm not against any of this stuff. Yeah, but, Just the bottom yeah. line is I'm 41 years old. I spent 39 years of my life identifying a woman as a woman. I'm not just going to change that in six months because you say so. Mm. I'm not against it. My theory behind it all is I don't, I, there's no more man or woman. Just tell me your name. I, I, I can get down with that. Like, and I, that's what I'll call you. Yeah. Like when we can't call people ma'ams anymore. Like, yeah. thank you, ma'am. Like, yeah. I don't care what you identify as. Just give me a name and then we can stop all the rest of this sensitive bullshit. <laughs> What was your name again? Right. You know and I'm horrible with names, so this is already going to suck. But <laughs> let's just be real about it. Like, I don't want to live in this space where I accidentally think that you're somebody that you don't identify as, even though my whole entire life, literally, when I saw somebody that looked like you, I identified them as one of the two sexes. Right. Because that's what I've been taught for too many years it is is the way that the world sees it and that's a whole nother subject but the point of this is is we got to be able to speak to each other in a way that is non-judgmental and let's just get down to the facts of life and let, let's talk about the real mental health aspect of things because i think i i want to talk about this too because i think what you guys are going to see in this podcast and what you're going to hear in this podcast is two two grown-ass men who live in a world of yesterday because yeah. we do, we yeah. we grew up in a, in a different world than what it is today, and I think what you're going to witness is two men like slowly uh, growing through this whole situation, absolutely, and growing in in, in you know we're probably going to say stuff early in this podcast that we might regret at, at episode one thirty two, you okay. know, <laughs> you know, and that's a possibility, and it's okay too, you know, like we're not, I'm not so I'm I'm you know how is something that I it's an acronym how it's honest open-minded and willing you know that open-minded part is something that i've learned in my recovery and in my life and in my careers that i have to have you know so i i feel like you guys are going to watch us grow and and struggle through this whole new world stuff yeah you know this progressive way of thinking and grow through failure grow through failure yes yeah 100 percent. so sorry so with this whole new situation in the world that we're living in my biggest fear currently is that mental health is is already in a bad spot huge hugely and it's horrible progressively getting worse because we're not allowed to talk about anything and that's funny too because what a lot of this a lot of the mental health advocates and recovery advocates which is mental health as well but you know a lot of the advocates out here which <clears throat> You know, a lot of the a lot of the movements going on are all about smashing stigma and being able to talk about and and us being able to. It's it's funny. There's this weird thing going on. It's like simultaneously at the same time, like don't talk about this, don't say that, don't you dare, you know, say these things anymore. You know that you've been saying your whole life. Don't you say these things anymore? But at the same time, you we have to be open and talk about it and go through our struggles, and we have to be open about our struggles and and you know all these different things. But yet, they just coincide. You know, for me, they do anyway. Like I'm supposed to be open and talk about things, but I'm not supposed to say this, this, and this. Right. When this, 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 and this is what I want to say and I want to talk right. about. Yeah. You know, and this goes even farther back. Like I have a different view on cursing than other relatives or uh, uh, older generation have. Right. You know, because I believe religiously it was shunned as far as, you know, what it technically says in the Bible, although I've been looking for it and I've never actually found where it says and anybody can, and can post a comment on the scripture itself because I've been looking for it. Yeah, and now you I got, don't if you use know the, that, please, yeah, put, please it below. put it down there. I, I know what it talks about the Lord's name in vain and, and, you know, all the other discussions that it goes down. But my point is, I believe that everything has its place. And so I don't have a problem with cursing personally, as long as I'm not like <laughs> degrading you, you know, like uh, as long as it's coming from like, get the fuck up. Like I'm trying to motivate you in, in something that I'm saying, or, you know, it's not shut the fuck up. There's a massive difference between the two. Mm. 
So fuck is such a powerful word, and, and it's used across the country. And when you talk about language in other countries, like in Australia, they use the c word in a completely different context. Oh god, that's a it's like that's a cool a, thing. That's like a what's up, bro? Yeah, that's, that's like, like your homie. What's up, C? Right. <laughs> so it's crazy. It's, it's when, when, interesting. When when, when uh, Jessica came over here, she was calling people cunts, and I was just like. You can't, you can't do, do that. that right, right. <laughs> like, that's, you can't do that. Right. It's just like, why? I don't get it. Which is my point. Yeah. So now let's, let's, let's get into the recovery side of this thing for a minute because I've been thinking a lot about this because we sat down recently and we should have been recording like normal. I think we should just walk around <laughs> recording shit. But um, that's the way. Let, let's talk about the uncomfortable conversation. Is addiction a disease or a choice? <laughs> and I'm going to try to rock the boat a little bit here because I'm going to play the devil's advocate because I have a different way of thinking in general, even though I've struggled with addiction myself on a very serious level. I uh, spent 25 years addicted to many different things. Uh, started when I was 12, general pot, the whole nine, and then went into heroin, meth, you name it. Um, severely addicted to pain pills, which, you know, then I lost my insurance that turned into heroin and then Just meth to try to balance. You know, that's it's, yeah. it's the... It's the obvious story that, which we can get into later about how that turns into like, we obviously have a problem and it's the same story almost every time. But again, is addiction a disease or a choice? What do you think? For me? Uh Uh-huh. For me, like, I'm at the point, like, I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks when it comes to, to, because most people that have these very uh, boisterous opinions about this subject have never lived addiction. Like any comments that I've seen over the years uh, or people talking about addiction, whether it's a disease, nine times out of ten, it's somebody who's never lived it. So I don't give a fuck what you think. That's right. how. I, that's that's where I'm at with that. I hear you. Uh, and at, and on the other side, it's like it doesn't fucking matter. We're losing people every day, whether it's a choice, disease, or a choice. But my firm belief, I believe, I know that it's a disease. Like for me, it's a disease. It's a disease that I had. Uh, it's a genetic predisposition. It's it's environment. But you know, it, it boils down to this. Like uh, the argument's always the same. Like oh. You're just, <clears throat> that's your excuse, you know, that's, you need an excuse to, to behave in the way you do. And, and for me, it's not an excuse. For me, when I found out that my addiction was a disease, it was like an, an aha moment, like, oh shit, that makes sense. Because I've been wondering for years why I can't get out of this. I've been wondering for years why I try and struggle and try and try and try and try so hard and I can't get through it. And I can't stay sober, and I can't keep uh, doing all these other, be- all the chaos and misery, and all the behaviors that come with addiction. Like, why can't I stop doing these things? I can't figure it out. And I'm telling you, bro, I'm at the point where I'm suicidal and homicidal at the same time, trying to figure this out. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> and the argument's always the same. I can't believe you put yourself in the class as somebody who has cancer. You know, or something like that. I'm like, I I do. Glad you said that because this is where I I stand, right? I stand in it's both. What I've what I've come to recently, and I'll I'll get into this in a minute. But here's why I think that it's both. I believe that I didn't wake up one day and think doing fucking heroin was going to be cool. That's not the choice that I made, right? Like I didn't want to be that person. However, there is a solution, just like cancer, just like diabetes. There is a treatment, right? That I then can choose to accept or not. And that choice is very difficult for everybody. Yeah. And I believe it's just as difficult for cancer patients that are like, do I want to be miserable for the next five years do and I, still maybe do, die? Do I want to chemo? Basically. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, do I want to go through that kind of shit and then still maybe die? Or do I just want to live out the rest of these three years the best that I can? Yeah. It's the same choice. Right. So I believe it's a little bit of both. But one thing that struck me recently that has just been really interesting to me and and it just kind of randomly came to me was so we can't prove chemical imbalance right like there's no test for it so is it possible that addicts are quite possibly some of the most chemically balanced people in the world and here's why i say this a lot of addicts are very high functioning You, you know a lot of very 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 wealthy uh, business people that have a very high functioning brain that is going so damn fast that any chemical eruption or, or interruption is the word I'm actually looking for causes mass hysteria in the brain where it, and now it's off balance in, in its actual purpose. So what I mean is 
if your brain is supposed to function like that, and then you do something like heroin and it chemically sets it off balance. Alters it. Now, while you may feel like that's normal, you've now actually imbalanced your brain. Okay. I can, I can hear you say that. But for me, what I believe is that the majority of us and the chemical is, is, is you know, it varies. But the main chemical is the lack of dopamine. Mm-hmm. It's the lack of dopamine that I believe in this, which is why the genetic predisposition is my belief in it. Because I feel like I personally, you know, I, I suffer from behavior problems and all these other problems that, that an addict suffers from while in active use. I did that before use, right? So... <clears throat> When addiction has nothing to do with the actual physical addiction, it's more of the mental side. It's more of the chemical imbalances, the irritable, restless discontent, the behavior problems, the the overactive uh, mind, the the OCD, all these different mm-hmm. things that that when an addict who who has these these things going on and these lack and and or like me has lack of dopamine produced in the brain, lack of you know, dopamine, serotonin, these kinds of things. When I use drugs, dopamine spikes, Mm -hmm. right? So serotonin, dopamine, all these chemicals get released. Like, and, and that's what I feel like normal people have, right? But when a normal person who has correct chemical imbalances and correct dopamine levels and serotonin, when they, because let's face it, man, everybody did a bump, you know, in college, I don't care who you are. Like I've only met a few people who have never done drugs in their life, and and that's right. awesome. My hats off to you. But you know, I you know, me doing cocaine and a normal person, you know, in college at a college party and they snort a little cocaine, right? So they get the the dopamine spike too. But the next day, they go back to normal. They go back to how everything's, you know, kind of okay. Maybe they might be a little hungover. Our dopamine plummets so low, and the only thing we can think about is, holy shit, and this is a subconscious thought, holy shit, like, I know how to fix this now. I am down here where I've been my whole life, and last night I did something that made me feel good, that made me feel normal. So I'm going to go back to that. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to keep doing that. Right? Right. And then, you know, you do that every day. Of course, the physical addiction sets in. But here's the thing with the choice or disease, too. I want to get into that. I think this is a very powerful point. It's like, oh, you, you chose to do these things. You chose. Yeah, I did. I chose to do drugs. I chose. So did you. I chose to drink alcohol. I chose to go to the bar. So did you. Right. Things, you know, it's just like sugar in it with a diabetic. My body reacts differently when I take in sugar as a diabetic when they take in sugar. Right. My body reacted differently when I drank alcohol versus when you drank alcohol. So, yes, I did make choices. It's just like uh, you choose to have unprotected sex. Does that mean HIV is not a, not a disease because you chose it? Okay, then let me, or, let me ask you this. Then. One more thing, though. You chose to smoke cigarettes. Does that make lung cancer not a disease because you chose to do it? No, here this this is the road we're going down. I'm actually interested that you said that because while if we knew for a fact that cigarettes actually caused it's it's a known cause, meaning it's part of the cause. All right, but if you look at like I'll think of him in a minute, but he used to smoke cigars. I, I feel like, like his name is Bernie. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna go with Bernie. Yeah, but but my point is like he smoked cigars. Like, that's all you saw him do, and he died at like ninety something years old. Right, because he didn't believe. That it was ever going to give him cancer, right? So there are things that are known to cause cancer, meaning like there are certain chemicals that are. That I, I think that society has now just f- found new ways to blame things, and I believe the brain is more powerful than that. That's just how I think. Can be. So I think the difference between like a diabetic and an addict is that diabetics have a, an insulin deficiency that is caused by a different part of the body that you can't control, mm-hmm. and yet the brain is so much more powerful than that. That I believe it's possible to find new ways to spike dopamine, to find new ways to trigger that part of the brain by retraining, which is, don't get me, I'm not discontent, I'm not discounting addicts in any level because I've struggled with this for a very long time. I just have always believed in my head 
because I've been labeled bipolar, schizophrenic. I mean, you fucking name it. I've been on every medication on the planet by 50 <laughs> different doctors that have all told me something was wrong with me. But in my heart, <clears throat> I just didn't feel right. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I've taken all the medications. You know, even the doctor that said you're going to be taking Oxycontin for the rest of your life because you snapped your arm in half and you'll never get over the pain. We know that's not true in, in reality because I live a perfectly fine life. I'm not taking Oxycontin every day. Right. And I'm living normal. I bodybuild. I mean, nothing sets me back. Right. Because my brain was stronger than that. Even though doctors, people who went to school for too many years, told me. Well, they were they that, were they were indoctrinated into that idea. Right. Like, like that's that, and that's that's key. my my point to all this is, I understand that we may be predispositioned in a setback technically, but I believe in my heart that that's what makes addicts so amazing is that they now have to work harder to become that great. And when you work harder to become something that great, that's all you are. You value it too. Right? It's like people that live in poverty and then become, oh, there's a lot of people that go from poverty because they're like, I don't believe this is where I'm supposed to be. And they become like this, some of the most wealthy people on the planet because where they were brought up was not their, it predisposed, yeah, because they didn't decide to have broke parents, right? That wasn't their choice. They didn't decide to be six years old starving. Right. That was not their choice, but- they made up their mind that that wasn't going to be their destiny. Well, and, and that's the thing about people in long-term recovery. You know, we finally, at some point in our life, me, I was 35, mm-hmm. we finally had enough. And we were fucking, this, this switch happened in our minds. And, and, and I think it's happened probably with every al- addict and alcoholic in long-term recovery. There's something that flips in the mind and you say, I am done and I'm going to do whatever Ever it takes to get out of this shit, and not only am I gonna, and 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 in that mindset is is something great that happens because because it's now we have to fight through something incredibly hard, incredibly tragic, incredibly difficult, you know, and we have to surrender these things that basically I had to surrender everything that I thought I knew about life, and 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 give it up and say you know what that's bullshit. And it's not working for me. So now I got to take on a new set of ideas and beliefs. And the belief system is the most powerful thing in the world. You know, if I believe I can do something, God damn it, I'm going to do it. Right. You know, and, and, and that's everything. I mean, I don't know. And that's the same thing in society, too. Like, the belief system. Like, the four-minute mile. Like, what, what was his name? Roger Banner. Was that his name, anybody? Roger yeah, Banner, yeah, yeah. I think, was the first, and, and if that's wrong, <laughs> it's you can go you ahead and cut that out. Comment down below, and we'll, we'll just let you have that. <laughs> I think one. it was him. Anyway, yeah. So he was the first person to break the four minute mile back in nineteen sixty or seventy, whatever it was. You know, I'm I'm not good on my facts right now, but he was the first person. It was said that it can never be done. The four minute mile can never be broke. One guy broke it. Mm-hmm. Soon after that, like. Hundreds of people have broke the four minute mile. High school kids have broke the four minute mile. What changed? What changed? Their belief system. The belief system. Right. Changed. Just like holding your breath. I think I'm it was it like right now. it was like a few minutes for the longest time, and then they just believed you'd die, and then it was like six minutes, and now it's something like a half hour. Somebody can hold their breath for a half hour. There are people that have been underwater for more than a half hour and done the deepest dives, and it's like it's it's the way that you I gotta hold be, it through hey, your lungs, of, and then hey Chris, let's get one of those guys on the show. I can do that. Yeah. It's in like, I was researching all these different things, and that's my point, is I believe that we were put here to grow. I believe that, and I believe that since day one, so my belief is clearly just God-given. That's how I feel about it. The belief, look, it's just like anything. you got people who will literally kill themselves, jump off a building, blow themselves up over a belief system. Right. Over what they believe. Right. You know, so the belief, that if you can take on a belief, like, that's, that's real. It's real. Like, there's nothing in the world that's going to tell you that it isn't real. You know, right? So I was just discussing this actually with a with, with somebody dear to me. I'm, I'm going to leave him anonymous for this moment, but um, it was what I what I told this person over the phone was the the best thing that I believe that you can understand is that every single one of your thoughts is a lie until you can actually factually make it true. Mm. All right. Like I'm not good enough. Prove it. Well, because I, I don't believe that you're not good enough. I believe that you believe it. But I don't believe that you're never not good enough, but a lot of people do. And then a lot of people get stuck in this construct of like, well, it's enough. It's never enough for me, and it never has been enough and I for think me. And that's it's, not a, it's not a money chase. It's a life thing. When I die, I'm going to ask myself a few questions. Did I love? 
Did I live? Did I matter? Mm. Right? What's the legacy I live? Like, behind? what, yeah, what, no matter if it's one person that remembers me or a thousand, what am I going to be remembered as? You know what, though? <clears throat> I want to tell you this because you brought that up, but that's, that in itself is the reason I got sober one time, you know, my first time getting sober. Because I, I, overde- I overdosed in this nasty, disgusting trap house of a bathroom. And I came to next to a toilet filled with, with shit that hasn't been flushed in days. <clears throat> and it was filthy and it was disgusting. And I came to, and I don't know if it was an epiphany or <laughs> I was just really high. But I thought to myself, like, holy shit. Like, this is the legacy that I'll leave behind for my children. Because no matter what you did, you'll be remembered as for the dude that, that OD'd in next to the toilet. Especially for people closest to me. Yeah. Like, nobody in the world is going to remember that shit. But right. the people closest to me, right. and the people that know my story, and the people that tell my story, and my kids grow up in that, and they hear, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember your dad. Oh, man, yeah, he overdosed in that trap house, in that bathroom, you know? Fuck, you know? Like, I, that was the legacy... That I, and the footprint that I leave behind was one of the things that really... Yeah, I didn't get sober that day. Okay. But it was uh, a seed that was planted like, holy shit, like this is what I... This is what I'm going to... I'm going to die. I'm, I'm however old right now and this is what I'm going to do. Right. My, I'm, There's a hundred different ways to the mountaintop. Uh, yeah, right? I want to fucking... If I'm going to die, I want to die on top of the mountaintop. Right. You know what I mean? I don't want to die down here next to the shitter. Yeah. You know, and that was... You know, that was the reason I got sober once, so... So... I have come to live in a space where I now believe because I've changed my beliefs, right? right. Like I, I when you when you're chasing money for a very long time, you learn that it's never enough. Yeah. Right? Because as you make more money, you buy more expensive things and then everything <laughs> just keeps going up. More money, more problems. It's never enough, right? More like, money, and, more problems. And I've been at the top of the societal mountain where I was making so much money I didn't know what the hell to do with myself where I didn't even think about money when I spent it I just swiped my card and I didn't worry about what was left over in the bank account there wasn't like a balance to the checkbook right I didn't care about that part I just knew it was always going to be enough and then it now has gotten to a point where it's like do I really want that because what's a what does that matter like I, I wear clothes and people think that I'm wealthy but it's <laughs> like I'll be wearing ten dollar jeans it's just the way I carry myself, right? Like, it doesn't matter what you're wearing. It's how you present yourself, and that's where the value actually takes place. That's what I love about Gary Vee. You know what I mean? Multi, multi-millionaire, and he's wearing some $30 pair of jeans. Right. You know what I mean? So, sorry. So, getting back to this whole, like, okay, so we're, we're going to go with, and, and I'm, not a, I'm not against it. I do believe on some level it, it has been formed as a disease. Well, I mean, here's the thing about that, though. Like, fuck, dude. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter. Like, it, I'm not using, and, and I get where some people get pissed off about it. Because a lot of people are saying, well, I'm just an addict. And, and it doesn't, that's not going to excuse you. Right. That doesn't get you out of the, the crime you just committed because you come up in front of the judge and say, well, I'm an addict, alcoholic, and this is, that's why I did it. It doesn't, that's not going to work. Like, it, I didn't use it. That's one thing about, and I see people do that. I didn't use it as an excuse. I used it as fuel. Like, when I was telling you this story a minute ago about when I figured out that addiction was a disease, when somebody finally brought that to my attention and explained that to me, for me, it wasn't, it was, it was an aha moment to the point where I was like, okay, I get it now. But the most important part of that was, is I get it and I know how to, like, I suffer from a disease that has no cure but a disease that has a solution. Okay. And now I can work on the, because I, I get it because I'm worried about why I'm doing all these things. Fuck, mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about that now. Now I can work on the solution and how to get out of this and how to stay out of this, which is the most important part. Okay. Can I challenge that? Sure. Okay. So we're, we're saying there is no cure. I disagree. Okay. I believe that you can retrain your brain to do whatever the hell you want it to do. So if you're suffering from dopamine, I believe that you can retrain your brain to activate more dopamine in your system and that you can spike because it's it's a release of it's neurons that are firing and wiring and it's it's constantly evolving and it's ever changing in its in its element and it's already happened. Well, that's just like saying you can think your way out of uh, you can you can think your way and this is true. I believe this to be true. 
you can think your way out of cancer. I, I, I do. I, do I, I think that's crazy. I, I, and I, I think most too. people will hear me say that and they're like, you're an idiot. Right. But I do believe, like, we use, what, 6% of our brain? Like, right. there's, there's, like, beyond measure, like, there's some people in our life, in, in our history that's gone through and, 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 you know, who have had these abilities to do amazing, the Buddha, Jesus, uh, so many people, right? Right. right? Gandhi, I don't know. You know, and, and they, what I believe is they've evolved and they use more percentage of the brain, and they're able to do these kinds of things. Right. But but I know. don't believe that they're like, no, we're, we're going to take some of these Jesus, primarily being the biggest one out of the equation, um, only because of some people don't believe in that. So let, let's take the, the realistic people uh, into the equation that have actually gratified right. or, or defined reality in a different form. Um, even back to, like, um, let, let's go to how the world came to be such as the, the invention of electricity, electric cars, uh, you know, houses. We were walking around at one oh, point. Oh, which, that was from which, aliens, by the way. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> which came from I, somebody... It's just my belief. Just, just not believing something and, and, and believing in a different reality and, and the exploration of the universe and, and all these new things. And then somewhere along the lines, it got lost in the sauce, and now we've got 19,000 fucking diseases. Because we're just putting names on shit. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, you take a drug that's for depression, and now you've got this other fucking thing that's happening with your hands, and now you need a new drug. I just saw a commercial <laughs> for it, and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. So it gives Besides, you you're or... you're literally taking somebody's brain and you're altering it to fit your narrative. And I like I believe it's just a language that we've decided as a society to start calling shit. Just like I call God, God. That's my belief. I've never seen him. I don't know Jesus. I know Jesus in my heart, but I've never met the dude. Right. Right? Or girl, whoever wants to say that. I'm going to say dude. Right? <laughs> See what he had to do there? Right. You, that I mean, that, that you, was that, instant. That, you know what I mean? That's this what, is what I'm talking about. That's what you have to do today. Right. Because know? as soon as I said dude, a bunch of people went, eh, and they turned it off. And, no, like, dude, and as far as I'm concerned, my cool, God turn is that a girl. shit off. My right. God is a female. You right. Know? And your God can be whoever you want. That's your discussion when you get to have later in your life. But my point is, we're just putting names on shit. Like, it's just a language, right? Labels. So, I believe disease has been just labeled. Well, We're just finding new ways to give people excuses to have problems, and I believe that's going to be the downfall of society, is that we're just giving you an excuse to be a piece of shit, and my point is, although I was supposed to be a piece of shit most of my life, I'm not today. And that's because I believe differently. It's not because of a fucking, I don't take a magic pill, I don't do anything special. That's what everybody's looking for, though. Is that magic? There pill? isn't one. Yeah, sure. If there was, I'd take two, right? Right. <laughs> it's a cure for addiction. I wonder what two will do. Anyway, like, and I think what it is, though, man, is like we live in a society, and I was this guy, too. Like, I was not going to do anything that was difficult or hard in my active use. I wasn't. There was nothing. I mean, when it, especially if it required me. To have discipline and to show up and to be on time and to get up early and stay late and work hard and, and put in my time and, and, and work harder than I got paid for. and it just, I, I wasn't going to do that. But you did it. I have. I've, like no, I said, no, no. What I mean is to, no, it's a lot of work to be no, an addict. No, but, but there's something that's... <laughs> <laughs> there's Let's be so, honest. There's a lot of work to what? To be an addict. Fuck, you want to dude. talk about chasing down your fucking drug dealer and finding different ways to make money and having uh, to be on time while your drug dealer's not and the <laughs> nine million other problems that you... Like, it's a lot of work. I don't think people understand. A lot if of you people, put as a much lot of effort say, into being sober as you did into being an addict, you would be fucking ridiculous. A lot of people will talk about the, uh, how, um, you know, recovery is hard. Yeah, it is. But it's about half as hard as addiction. Right. You know, and early recovery is hard. I don't want people to think that, you know, getting into it's going to be rainbows and butterflies because it's not. You got to work on shit. You got to basically, like you said a minute ago, you got to redevelop neurological pathways in your mind when your mind doesn't want to do it. And that's what I mean is like I believed too for the very longest time that it was just a disease and there was no cure. I did believe that for a very long time. I now, when you say the word cure, though, I mean... You, what I mean is like... When you say I, the word cure, you're talking about a pill, you're talking about a snap of a finger, you're talking about an operation, you're talking about this. What about know, the fix? Well, I what think language solution, do you want to put on I want to put it? Okay, should we call it the solution? Yeah. Okay. I think we, we got to... It's not one solution, it's 
multiple It's a lot. Of, you're absolutely right. Yeah. What I mean is in the level of when it comes to addiction, I believed in my heart that I was going to get high in that same way without a third-party substance, without plant tech is what they like to call it. <laughs> right? Plant tech. I believed that it was possible. And so I kept going until I found it. Well, let me ask you this, though. How did you get that belief system? What happened to you? Because I know for a f- unless you're way different than me, when we're in that active addiction for 20 years, 25 years, there's not a lot of thinking about, I, I have strong self will. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to, you know, something. What happened to, to change your belief system? You know, because that's the thing. Like, that, there's got to be something. And for most people, it's, it's a very, it's a very tragic thing that happens or it's a very, like we talk about rock bottoms all the time. Like, and this is just an example. Yeah. And I'm really curious of what happened to curious what happened to you, but we as addicts in order, it's not everybody because everything's different, but we as addicts in order to get to, to want recovery, to want a different life, to change our belief systems, we have to hit a rock bottom. For some people, rock bottom is still in twenty dollars out of the grandma's purse, and the grandma find out about it, and the shame, the guilt, and remorse is enough for them to change. Get some person that's getting a DUI and going to jail and being embarrassed, and that's enough for them to change. For me, it was living in the streets, overdosing, people dying around me, all these horrible things, all these tragic things happening to me. Before I finally, got, I'm a quick learner, it just takes me forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of shit that had to happen to me. Yeah. But that rock bottom is a necessity. Like I, I say this all the time, pain is the price of admission into recovery. Yeah. So what pain, what happened to you to change? Was it any one specific no, thing? No, it was it was like a it was like a, a chain of events, right? Mm-hmm. Like I had I had done the whole I'm gonna get sober by myself kind of thing, right? I'm gonna detox in my room. I can do this by myself. Like, <laughs> I'm just I don't, gonna I don't, wean myself. I don't off. fucking need anybody. I don't need any. Did meat. you try I weaning? I, oh yeah, of course. I like. I believe me. The first, the very first time, I I, I have 13 pills. Yeah. All right, and I'm on day one. Right. And I'm gonna take I'm gonna take one for 13 days, or right. and I'm gonna cut it down right. half by half. Right. And by day two, I'm in. I'm out. Right. <laughs> which which turned me back to the my street doctor, of course, who got me Suboxone, and I didn't course. know how to take that shit either. So the very first time. I got Suboxone. I made it about nine hours, although it felt like 37. Of course. And you're supposed to wait technically 24, but everybody's different. I made it about nine. I took too much and went into like the worst withdrawals you ever fucking imagined. Of course. I, you, absolutely, fucking imagine. you absolutely did. So then what do I do? I just take more, thinking that's going to fix it. And then it was literally like 47 days of hell. There you go. Yep. Because I was like, but I've already made up my mind. I'm going to keep trying. I'm just going to live in this shit because here I am. And at that point, I had already told, you know, my people that I was getting my stuff from, like, don't, because mm-hmm. I'm done. Mm-hmm. And and you had people in your life at that time, even your drug dealers or whatever. even then, yeah, because that, that it, cared enough about that, you that, that for like, whatever reason cared enough to say okay, yeah. And so that didn't work, and then it turned into another event, and then I had you know a Thanksgiving dinner with my family, and my brother told me that it was. You know, he was surprised to see me because he thought I was going to be dead the next time, and he was scared to answer the phone. And I realized now I'm holding my family hostage, of course, which I never thought about before. I thought I was holding myself hostage. Well, that's the nature of our disease: is uh, selfish and self-centered. Right. Yeah. So then, my dad fires me from a company that I helped build. <laughs> that's a kick in the teeth. From you know? fucking five hundred thousand to six million dollars, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'm now down to a delivery driver again. I'm now getting fired. So you want to talk about a roller coaster all the way to the top and all the way back down to the bottom? where I'm, I'm drilling holes in my warehouse door, peeking out, looking for the cops kind of a thing, and I'm running a successful business. And I had customers that loved me. Like, I was actually a functioning addict in technicality, but I was just done. Well, like, I just that, hit that point where I was like, this is fucking stupid. Well, uh, not only that, like, it sounds like you hit a rock bottom. Yeah, just a different level of it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you was at the bottom. You was once at the top. Right. Of course, that was your views at the time. That right. You at the top was money and prestigious and yep. a job and all that shit. So your views at the time is like... Like you went down to a delivery driver and you got fired. Right. Your dad cut you off. So it's kind of a, it's a rock bottom. But here's what I've learned. In the recovery of everything and learning that, like for me personally, living that, that, that life of meetings all the time when you have a significant other that doesn't understand it or doesn't want to live in it and like that, uh, that in, in my eyes, doesn't, that's not what like keeps me sober because at some point in time I have to be alone. Hmm. Like 
unless you're going to live in the room of meetings at some point in time. Which some of us do it at first. Right, and I'm not against that. I'm right. not saying that it doesn't have its place because for me, in very early recovery for the first year, it was like five days a week. And, and when I wasn't in a meeting, I was hanging out with people in meetings. Like, that was my life. But I had a meeting with my therapist because we were having a conversation about things and I was struggling with who I was dating at the time and... and my therapist said, I want to ask you a question because it sounds like you're struggling with something because she was drinking and feeling bad about doing it in front of me. And she said, if the point of recovery is, per, you know, progress, not perfection, then why are you trying to be the perfect addict? <clears throat> let's, 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 let's dissect that too. Cause okay. I, I, I hate when people say that shit. I hate when people say progress, not perfection. Cause to me, that sounds like an excuse sometimes mm-hmm. progress, not perfection. It doesn't say that it says actual, it says spiritual progress, not perfection. Okay. Yeah. You know, people like to leave that part out because okay. they've heard it, but yeah, cause uh, not saying you did that because you didn't at all. But when people make mistakes, they like to say, they like to quote that, well, it's progress, not perfection. Like, don't do that. You know what I mean? Right. And, and in my recovery, I never heard it that way. Right. Brutally honest. I've read the big book. I've been through the 12 steps. I, I've done all those things. Right. Um, my point to where I'm at in recovery today right. is that I believed that in my heart, I knew that at some point in time, I was going to have to be alone with myself with my own thoughts. And the way that I'm wired now because of hitting my rock bottom is you can either grow when you don't have a choice, you know, when you've hit rock bottom or you can continue to grow while you're still where you're at. Right. So why wait? Why do, why do I have to go all the way to the bottom before I grow? Because then I'm just going back to where I was. Why can't I just continue to grow? So I started to find new ways to spike dopamine and started to find new ways to have these connections. And it came in the most <sighs> gloriously fucked up way possible. Because I'm, I was raised in the house where you don't cry. I was raised in the house where you know emotions right. are different. Where we we usually only hug when you're like coming in the house or leaving the house. Like, and I love my dad to death, but he wasn't a very like physical person, and he wasn't around a lot because he was supporting the family. Um, and which I just I'm very school, close. Which is the old school. Way. But I'm close with my dad. Like I'm not the victim. Like oh my dad was never around. No fuck that. My dad is amazing. Right. Right. That's how I choose to see things. But I just it, it's different for me than it was other people. It's perspective for yeah. me. So with me. I just knew that I'm going to hit that moment where I'm going to be alone. So I'm going to face it now and let's just fucking, let's just see what happens. Yeah. Right. And, and, and <clears throat> relapse is not an option for me. You know, I know that they're like, it's part of the progress bullshit. It's not part of the process. I hate it's that bullshit. Relapse is never part of the process unless you allow it to be. I don't believe that anything in your life is part of anything unless you allow it to be right. So for me, that wasn't an option. When it came to my relationships, it was like, I'm not going to let you be the reason that I relapse because you're not worth it. And that's nothing. That's not a dig on you. That's just the reality of who I am. Well, it's, 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 you've somewhere along the lines learned to love yourself and you knew, right. and you knew in your, I'm, I'm speaking for you, you knew in your heart a relapse to you would, would be death. Right. Death. So Nothing's I decided to death. get very uncomfortable. There you go. There I you started go. admitting all the fucked up thoughts I was having in my head to my wife. <laughs> How'd that turn out? It, it, very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Our very first date was very interesting. And a lot of things since then have been very interesting. But but I knew that that's what I needed in my life before I met my wife. So I believe that that's who I attracted. Absolutely. Right? Because Absolutely. like attracts likeness. So I mm. knew what I needed was a woman that would just allow me to be a fucked up individual because that's the thoughts in my head. I'm a worst case scenario guy. I see somebody attractive in the gym and he's fucking my wife before she's even gotten home. She's never even talked to him. Right. She doesn't even know who she, he is, right? <laughs> what are you talking about? Right. But that's that's <clears throat> that's yeah. where, you know, the insecurities of my life and all these things happen. And so I just started living in them for a minute and allowing myself to understand well, I think, all those thoughts weren't true. Well, here's the thing, too, about, and this is what I do in my program, and I'm not, I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm going to say it. Progress, not perfection. <laughs> <laughs> but in verbalizing shit, for us in recovery, it's... It's it's communicating. I have to write shit down often just to just to see how dumb I am. Mm-hmm. You know, my my sponsor Paul he tells me all the time, Marty, say that out loud so you can hear how dumb you are. Yep. So so you can hear how dumb you sound right now. You know what I mean? And um, when you it's like a resentment. So if you would have never have been open and communicated with your wife about, hey, are you you know that dude at the gym. I imagine you approached that differently and yeah. said it differently, but you, you got to verbalize how you was thinking at the time. Right. 
but what that did is it it allowed you to say it out loud, mm-hmm. talk about it, communicate about it, and then you don't have a resentment or a thought in your head after the conversation. Right. You're like, oh shit, that was that was just me. Right. So they call them limiting beliefs, right? Okay. What most of your thoughts, and and this is what. The, the limiting belief factor is that most of the limiting, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not supposed to be here, you know, my wife doesn't love me, um, I'm too much like my father, all, all these things are called limiting beliefs, right? It's it's you allowing yourself to limit yourself to your full potential because of something that you say you believe. I struggle with that today. Which is, I, I, I believe that, that I believe that the world does and I'm so sick of it being okay. Yeah. Like I literally, I, I'm still that uh, addict and alcohol. I, I refer everything to my... Because my life is recovery. Mm-hmm. Right? Everything I do, touch, taste, smell, talk about is recovery in some sense because recovery has nothing. Like I, you'll know in our 12 steps that it only mentions alcohol in the very first part of the very first step, right? It doesn't mention it anywhere else in any of the steps because it has nothing to do with alcohol and drugs. Right. So <clears throat> my life is recovery. Everything I talk about, everything I do, everything I try to do, but like I struggle with the, the whole impending doom thing, the bottom's going to drop out, I'm not good enough, am I doing enough? And, I, and part of me, like, I, I always struggle, like, every morning I'm up, and I'm, I'm, my brain's firing, it, you know, as soon as I wake up, I'm like, oh, shit, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do this. I'm not good enough, I'm not doing enough, I'm never doing enough. No matter what, if I work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, I'm not doing enough. And that, <clears throat> that could be, so I've been doing it for years like that, and right now, it's it's my fire. It's what it's why I am and where I'm at today in my life is because it's my it's my fire. I'm doing it, man. It's I, I don't believe I'm good enough, so I'm going to do harder. I'm going to do more, which I think is a lot of people in recovery why we're so good at. But you put an addict in recovery, and you give him a chance, you give him a new belief system, and he gets a job, and he start dude. You that dude at that job is going to work harder than anybody else in the building, right? Because he has a new. He has a chance. So let's get to the failure rate real quick, if you don't mind, because I'm glad you're talking about this, is why is the failure rate so high? It, well, be, it, it, it simply, you know, it, it, there's about probably a million answers to this. But for me, and what I see the most is, is people aren't willing to put in the work. Mm-hmm. People aren't willing to, to take on a new belief system. It, it sounds great, and I can say I'll do it, and I want to do it when I'm in front of the judge and I'm, I'm facing some problems in my life. I'm, I'm facing a divorce. I just lost a job. I just, all these things. Like, I'll, I want it so bad. But next day, when you got to get up at, at 5 a.m. and you got to put in these work and you got to do this for the next 12 hours today and you got to get up and do it again the next day and you got to get up and do it again the next day because you don't get to take a day off. You got to put your shit in. Most people aren't willing to do that. It's, uh, it's what there the has to be a solution road. in some, like I, I still want to believe in my heart and I'm not going to give this up that there, there has to be a better solution. I don't know if it's earlier. Yes, it, you're, not know, gonna, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to like solutions are what I'm willing to do. And you're not going to put it in somebody's head, willingness or drive. They got to do that on their own. They no, I, be I, I, I understand that, but I believe there has to be a way to help guide them to that. Like, there has to be, I didn't figure this all out on my own, right? And now, technically, I did, but there was a process to it that led me to it. And it's like, in 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 society's world, by a lot of other addicts, I mean, I, I was raised in, in a great home. All right. Dad, I never had to worry about food. I had fucking $1,000 rollerblades when I was, like, six years old. Like, I didn't struggle on any level. We were in poverty. There was nothing going on wrong in my life yet somehow at the age of magical 12 it seems to happen for everybody 12 13 yep i started getting high so where now i know that by the time you're seven the prefrontal cortex at that point is not fully developed so a lot of your beliefs come before then which is interesting in itself and that I didn't even start learning about drugs and all those things until after that because society says we can't, and I don't believe that either. Um, is that a possible solution to, like, should we, di- should we dive deeper and stop protecting? Right. Like, if you want to let a fucking child decide what sex they want to be in fucking kindergarten, oh my God. then why the hell can't we talk about drugs in school? 
I firmly believe, and I, I know countries that do this. Germany, I think, does this. Um, there's several countries that do education on addiction as early as in grade school, first, second grade. Like, it's a whole thing. Not just, like, they do it one time, and they have the dare guy come in and, and, and try to s- scare them straight, and they, right. none of that shit works. Like, like you you tell me drugs are bad, it's going to cause all these problems. Like, I was attracted to that. Right. I wanted that. Yep. Jack Daniels slash Guns N' Roses? Yep. All right. Yep. But it's it's not about it's, it's education. Okay. I think that's one of the things that... I want to say this, too. Like, and this is probably going to get... <laughs> I think drug all drugs should be legal. I do. I, I firmly believe... I don't think having shit illegal is stopping anybody or slowing anything down. It's not. They're right get now... a whole new tangent of, like, gun laws, and that they think, like, everybody breaking the law and getting shot has an actually registered weapon, which is fucking stupid. But anyways, I agree with you is my I point. Legalize all drugs, sell it at CVS, card people, they gotta be 18 or 21, whatever you decide, to buy the drugs... What happened? It's just like prohibition, man. You know, prohibition did no good for our society. It started gang wars and gangs and and funded gangs and and killings and murders and deaths and all this shit. Do you think there's an excitement level to the illegal factor to it that kind of is is making it something? It's not not only the excitement level, it's the street money that can be made off something when it's illegal. Right. You know, you take away, look, I mean, prohibition happened. You're not going to stop people from drinking, right? They're going to find ways and means to get it. So what happens? Now people can make alcohol. Making alcohol makes a lot of money. A group of us, now we're a gang. Now we're going to sell it. Now we're getting bigger. Now we're going to sell it on the streets. Now this other gang over here wants our alcohol. So now we're going to fight and we're going to kill each other. We're going to murder people. Right. And the alcohol itself is killing people because it's made in a bathtub and some steel <laughs> Now, you know what about on the level of like San Francisco that opened their whole like legal injection site and it wasn't doing anything and it was actually causing bigger crime in the area. That's legal injection sites. That's so not legal drugs. Okay. You know what it what prohibition does in the drug world right now is it's we have gangs. We have a guy over here with a gun in his waistband selling my 12-year-old son heroin. Right. You make heroin legal the guy over here selling heroin can't can't um, compete with the market of CVS. CVS is heroin is pure. It's made by the gov- made by the government. So right. It's pure. <laughs> it's it's made by somebody that knows more of what they're doing than these right. assholes pumping Put, it with they're not fentanyl put, and put shit. Fentanyl right. and car fentanyl in it to right. kill my. Fu- so they're not going to compete with it. So, therefore, the guy on the corner here with the gun in his waistband selling to my 13-year-old son, it's not going to be there no more. Right. You know, because now my 13-year-old son's going to be finding somebody who's 18 right. and saying, hey, mister, yep. you think you can buy me a bag? It's doing, it's doing no good. The war on drugs is an epic failure. I think what we should do, all the money we spend on the war on drugs, all the money we spend on locking up criminals and doing all these things, like we could take all that money, we can legalize drugs, we could take all the money that we spend towards this and this and this and this and housing criminals and all that we do, prison systems are booming, take all that money and put it into education. Put it into grade school education, saying, not saying drugs are bad, okay? Saying drugs... Look, man, here's what's going to happen to you when you snort right. your first line at, at, at what, 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 let's just say, Magical 13, right. 12. It's that you're going to like it. Well, it's now getting younger, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Because this is just the reality. You're, like, you're, you're going, it's, instead of saying, like, here's what happens. Parents and dare and all these things say, drugs are bad. And then the kid gets 13 and he snorts his first line of cocaine. He's like, wow, that's amazing. They lied to me this whole time. Right. You know, and then there so Now their belief is different. Yep. So they yep. had this belief that it was going to be bad, and then their belief system changed. So then you, take, you experience it, right? Because experience yeah. creates belief. Absolutely. So let's so, change the belief system on some level. Oh, so we do that with education. Okay. We take all this billions of dollars. We put it into education. We put it into treatment centers. We put it into, uh, you know, you're going to do this, this, and instead of locking people up. Right. For, you know, you got people that, that possess, you know, that are, Addicts and alcoholics doing life in prison, you know, it's just uh, how, how is that helping? Yes, I, I do believe for a fact that if you commit a crime 
whether on drugs or not, you, you got to pay for that. One hundred percent. You know, you got to pay for that. It's not an excuse for anything. No. Yeah. But but a lot of this wouldn't be a problem right now if we did it that way. Okay. Because I guarantee you, right now, if we legalize heroin in in, in America and meth and whatever else, right? We <laughs> well, there were opium my, dens back in the day right. that were similar. But my, but my neighbor over here, which looks like a fine, upstanding young couple over here, they right. got the dog and you know white picket fence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, dog's probably named Shep. You yep. know what I'm saying? I guarantee you. If we legalize it today, they're not going to go down and buy a bag of heroin. Right. So it's not going to cause this huge uprising in heroin use. It's just not. Right. Education. Okay. That's my, that's my spill. So we have to change the belief system, educate further, uh, you know, getting to like a, a takeaway of some form. So we're, we're trying to educate further. We're, we're trying to change beliefs. We're trying to understand it in a, on a new level because what... This is the craziest thing about our society, and, right? And, is and that a belief you, system? And if you do get happen to get addicted to it, which there will be millions of those, right? Here we got a program for you, right? Instead of instead of what we find in society today is we got you know a large portion of everybody doesn't have med- insurance or they have Medicaid, right? Because of where we're at in society today, nobody's working. Mm-hmm. They can't get a bed. Because all the Medicaid facilities are got waiting list, so if you do happen to get addicted, here's where you can go. You know. Okay, so so we're we're educating, we're 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 treating differently, we're we're legalizing. I mean, we're definitely living in a new America at this moment in time. It's but progressive uh, uh, way of thinking, I isn't mean, it? Here we go. Let's let's see if we can get some left liberals to jump on board with us here. <laughs> let's see if they can. You want to talk about progressive? Let's let's talk uh, about progressive. Yeah, they like to be. Uh, want to be progressive? Let's talk about the real shit. I mean, let's talk about the real epidemic. The real epidemic is what we're talking about right now. Right. You know, of these, you know, heart disease is the number one killer in America. Right. And of the all the you know, I would I would love to see the statistics on the heart disease where drug addiction is involved in that. Yeah, because you know, drug addiction definitely leads to a lot of heart complications, heart disease, all these different things, smoking, all these things, right? Right. And if you know, this is one of the uh, I've been wanting to say this for a long time. If our if the people the powers to be really gave a shit about us, like they like they're claiming to do right now, why the you know. Cigarettes would have been illegal a long time ago. Cigarettes would have been illegal a long time ago. Or something. You know, because... Well, how many people die every year of cigarettes? Well, you're talking about cigarettes, diabetes, heart disease, all these things that are caused by what we put in our body. Oh, on God. the level of food. If they so cared about the us, FDA, why wouldn't they? Yeah. We're talking like now, now we're going down to... Again, we're going to have to restructure the government. And I'm all for this. And if you want to <laughs> jump on board... We're gonna need some supporters, so yeah, I'm comment run down for below. You know, Fuck comment it. down below, and we'll restructure the government for you on some level. Yeah, grassroots. And okay, so clearly this is an uphill battle, and I love it because I've done nothing but uphill battles since I think I was fucking born. Mm. Right? I think life is supposed to be an uphill battle because there's only one way to the mountaintop, and that's uphill. Right. No one's ever fell to the top of a mountain. Right. So now we're jumping to the top of a mountain, which is gonna be fun. We're climbing. Actually, I'm just gonna jump because it's so much more fun. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, frolic. And uh, <laughs> so we're, we're basically restructuring America at this point in time. And I believe part of that restructure in parents, if you were a parent out there, I want you to fucking listen to me because I had parents too. Although I'm not one, I do understand my parents very well. And what yeah. I do want to say is stop fucking ignoring your children. Like allow them to have uncomfortable conversation with you and it be okay. Make allow it, them it, to be gay, uh, straight, homosexual. I don't care what they fucking identify as. I don't care what they're going through. Let them have a conversation with you and then... Try to understand where they're coming from before you try to shape their beliefs for them because you do not know what's best for your child, whether you think you do or not. That's just the truth. Drop the mic. You got a mic drop sound over there, Chris? <laughs> uh. <laughs> that, that is, is not it. But we'll, we'll, we'll do something. <laughs> I mean, we gotta, let's, let's we face fix it. that there. Yeah. Like, I work on that, Chris. My parents didn't know what was best for me. They really didn't you like know, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a systematic structure to everything and I understand it, but I, we're going down the road of, if you want to let your child identify as something else than whatever, that's a whole nother conversation, but you're showing that you don't know what's best for your child because you're already allowing this type of stuff to happen. So if you really knew what was best, we wouldn't have any kids in school right now. Mm. 
So the bottom line is you really don't know what's best. All parents are just figuring this shit out. And the only way to understand your child and help your child get to what is best for him or her or them or they or their or fucking circles, I don't care, is <laughs> allow them to be who they are and they're perfect in their yeah. moment no matter what they are. They're exactly where they're supposed to be in that moment in time because that's the what they were created for and allow them to take their journey. And like I watched my wife go through this and it is fucking hard. And as a, as somebody that doesn't have kids, I don't understand this, but from the outside looking in, it's like, just let them fuck up. We're They're so, not going to die. We are so scared that our children are going to make mistakes. Right. We are. We, I mean, it goes back to the eighth place trophy bullshit. You know, let your kid fail. We're desensitizing let, the world. Let your kid fail. Right. Let your kill, kid. Like for me, I, I fail. I failed so many times. I fell often. I failed a day. You know, I mean, and that's what, that's the, in doing that is where I get my strength. Mm -hmm. And that's where I get my growth. I don't, I never grow when things are going great. Right. And I'm just like, everything's perfect. And I'm just going and, and, and I don't grow through that. And maybe you're different. Maybe you guys are different than me, but it's when shit is hard. You know, and I'm struggling, and I make a mistake, or I fail, and this 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 business fails. This happens. Somebody, you know, that's when I have to sit back and say, "Holy shit!" You know, and and that goes back to my perspective. Like, what? How do I view? How how am I? How do I choose to look at this? Mm -hmm. Do I choose to look at this like it's a failure and oh poor me? Right. Or I ch do I choose to look at this like this is a moment for me right. where I get to grow and I get to learn and I get to push through it. So we're going back to perspective. Everything in my life is... I, I believe that Everything perspective... Is perspective, I period. think it is. And, and I think a lot of people just don't get that because they go for the path of least resistance and the path of least resistance is like, oh, that sucked, I'm done. Well, that's I how we're up. wired. I give up. Like, society's allowed us... And, and I believe that... I, I heard a scientist recently talking about this on, on a different podcast and it just fascinated me. It's like, we were actually wired to struggle because our subconscious mind is actually wired to go back to technically what is the easiest meaning if you are scared of something you run away from it even though that makes your anxiety worse you're wired to run away so we're fight structurally or, fight or flight yeah so you got the parasympathetic and the sympathetic mindset and so the parasympathetic is the powerful mindset and the sympathetic is the fight or flight mm -hmm. and so in those two realities right you can be in a primal state or um you can be in a powerful state. And so in these two states of mind, you can choose and you can actually decide how you respond to everything, regardless of what's going on around you. And I think that's what it is. People do not know that they get to actually make the choices. Right, because people have been making choices for them their whole entire life. Either either people's been making choices for them their whole entire life or their subconscious is doing it for them. Right. And and they haven't trained their subconscious to do things to fight to fight. Right. You know? And that's what, it, that's what it is. Like, we got to a point in our lives where we were tired of taking the path of least resistance. I was so sick and tired of taking the path of least resistance because it took me nowhere besides straight to the gates of hell, basically. Let's be honest. It never gets anybody anywhere. And you can talk about society and, and you can bring up anybody. If you want to look at the greatest of the greats and you want to look at, like, the generic people and people are like, oh, I'm fine with that. And if you're fine with that, then may God be with you. Absolutely. I'm not okay with that personally hey, that's because a, I don't believe that's my purpose. I don't believe we were put here. If you look at the world as a whole, we have done nothing but grow. Right. The world does nothing but rotate. It moves forward. <laughs> period love it right so if the world is doing nothing but moving forward and we're standing still meaning it's the same job we do the same thing every day we see the same people everything goes the same way and we sit there and just fucking dream about winning the lottery <clears throat> or having all these fucking things that are right there you know you, you can't you can't get to the top of a mountain when you're climbing a mountain you can't stop because if you stop, you just don't start sliding down. Right. You can't stop. You can't get complacent. You can't be okay. You can't. And for like, I know a lot of people out here are completely happy, and and I'm not. Like I'm I'm like you, Brian. I am not happy with uh, a mediocre life. I I am not happy with a, a bottom feeder life, which I've always lived. Right. I'm not. When I got to mediocre, I was not happy with that. I, and I don't know if I'll get hugely successful enough. I'll be happy with that. Maybe not. You know. <clears throat> well, now now we're going into a definition of success, which is a completely different form and fashion in itself. Because sure, again, I mean, we're calling this language. But my 
my point to that is, is like when you're talking about success, most people value that is like money, right? Money and wealth, prestige. Money and wealth, and believe me, that is not success because I've literally been to a point I know, where I know, so I know, much fucking money. It was ridiculous. I know millionaires feel who are successful. Com- I know millionaires They're who are lonely. They miserable. hate their lives, right? Yeah. So success is actually measured by how you feel about yourself. Hmm. That like when you look in the mirror, if you're happy with what you see, you are successful. I don't care who you are. But I know people who make $40,000 a year and they go to their son's game every weekend and they show up to all these things right. and they, they're at home every night cooking dinner with their wife and they're completely ecstatic. Right. And, and, and love you for it. Love right. you for it. And the, and and I would still argue that they're they they could be happier. I would yeah, personally argue still argue. Um, I I believe that they have complacency has been okay because society has made us that way. Where as long as you make enough to cover your bills and you again we're putting monetary value on things. But, but again, it goes back to mental health. Right. Like, are you happy? Like, seriously, are, right. not even happy. Do you have joy in your life? Right. Happy is a thing that you can't you can't obtain. I don't think. You can be happy in a moment, but happiness is not something you can you, you can strive to have. Now, joy is a different story. You can have joy in your life when you feel completely blessed to be at your son's game, to be at home every night for dinner. You know, I, I have tried those. I've tried that, and it, it, I, I'm not wired that way either. Mm-hmm. Like I gotta be, a, I, I gotta be work. You know, I I, <clears throat> I know people who can't sit still, who can't stop. You know. M- m- my ex is like that. She absolutely will not. She It's 10 o'clock at night and she's still preparing for the next day and she's getting stuff and she's doing this. and she's, That's just how she's wired. And I am jealous of that sometimes. Yeah. You know, I, I go f- for a very long... And she, she made me feel like I wasn't doing enough most of the time. Right. <laughs> you know? And there's people like that. And, I and you know, I, I'm jealous of that. I am. I am. So I, I that's what I admire. So that's what I strive for. You so know? we're going now, to, like, don't you want to be happy? Yeah, I think so. I, you want to be happy, joyful, right. whatever language you choose right, to put right. on it, right? Like I, I, I choose to wake up and say that I'm happy every day, right? But I wake up in a place where I'm content in the suffering that I'm going to go through, right? Like I get excited about suffering. I enjoy pain because I believe it has a purpose, <laughs> right? Like I go to the gym, it fucking hurts. You know right. what I mean? I, I dieted down to such a low body fat that it was painful. Oh, I remember that, but it was fun, right? It was like I did that shit, but, but you accomplished it, right? So you I had a goal. I got you into the it. top five percent of the people in the world. Yeah, you, you had a physically. Goal. You set it, right? And you killed it. Boom! Now we're done, right? Checklist. Mark. What's next? What's next? What's now, next? now I'm on to the next, and here we are. We're in the podcast, which is going to be the number one podcast whoop, whoop. in the world. Talk hard, baby. just so you guys know. Everybody hashtag talk hard, right? So we're getting into what do we do next? So as we go into our next topic and our, and our next conversation. What do we do next for society as far as, like, you need to be present for your children. We, we need to open up our minds in the reality of that. What you believe is not actually possibly true. Well, that's the thing I say, and I've said many times, you don't see things how they are. You know, and that, it goes back to the belief system. You don't see things how they are. You see things how you are. You know? Right. How you are in that moment is how you perceive it. Right, it doesn't. It, it it's not how it actually is. So inward reflection leads to outward perception. Hundred percent, bro. Yeah. Wasn't that sexy the way he put that? <laughs> huh, huh, Chris? <laughs> so we're we're going down this road, and on the next conversation, we'll we'll get into things a little bit deeper, and it may be a totally different topic, and you guys are just gonna have to follow along. That's just the way this is gonna work because we just like to talk from the hip. But we're we're gonna dive deeper into what we do next, right? So. How do we how do we change the world? Because that's the whole point, right? Like I'm here to change the fucking world, and that's what I'm going to do on some level. Period. I'm not going to change the rotational force of gravity or anything stupid. I'm here to make an impact, and that impact can be just one person or it can be a million. I'm choosing for ten million. He's I don't going know, for like, ten. We're, we're going for all. He's of going them. for ten. Like, I just want you all to think about the reality that your life is where you are supposed to be right now, and you have the power to change it. No matter what you think, you have the power to change it. That is just the truth. And you can go into the scientific, and we'll get into that next topic, where you can realize that your body doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. Ooh, I like that. And this has been scientifically proven where people have actually been asked to play the piano, and they've watched the brain, and then people have been asked to stop and imagine playing the piano, and the brain fires the exact same way. I get it. I get it. So that's what we'll get into next, folks. We hope you enjoyed the podcast today. We'll see you next time.